I'm gonna be honest, I almost felt like not doing this video because the arguments presented in the video I'm about to debunk have been so overused and overplayed despite the plethora of evidence against them that it's quite annoying to deal with. But I'm still going to respond to this video because if these myths aren't debunked, then they're just going to keep spreading like wildfire. So today I'm going to be debunking a second thoughts video on how the National Socialist Party were in fact secretly capitalists. Yeah, that's a real original argument there. So, Second Thought is basically a Marxist socialist propaganda channel, and he doesn't even really hide it. He is very proud of that fact, to be honest. And this video is no different. Here, he makes the argument that the National Socialists were, in fact, not real socialists, but were actually capitalists. Now, how true are these claims? Well, he presents quite a lot of arguments, and as I mentioned, most of these arguments are not very original. In fact, they're basically preached at every major university by every liberal historian that tries to make the case that the Nazis were far right-wingers. Yet, the evidence that I'm going to present will completely destroy any doubt that the National Socialists were indeed real socialists. This episode is brought to you by Audible. So already we're starting off with a doozy in this video, with that second thought here being sponsored by Audible. You know, the company owned by Jeff Bezos, one of those big evil... Uh, corporate boogeyman that he loves to fear monger about, but we're just gonna ignore that and carry on with the video. One of the first things Nazis did when Hitler took office as German Chancellor was get rid of the socialists. Using as a pretext a fire in the German parliament, Hitler triggered a state of emergency and kicked into high gear his repressive politics against both Jewish people and communists. Members of the Communist Party were tracked down and imprisoned by Nazi police. The party itself was functionally outlawed, removed from parliament, and its members were pushed into either exile or prison. In fact, the sudden boom in prison populations from targeting the communists led to the creation of some of the first concentration camps, filled with socialists before becoming one of the major sites of the Jewish genocide. Soon enough, this repression of political opponents would go beyond the communists and extend further right to the Social Democratic Party. In the end, both parties that represented labor in the German parliament, whether revolutionary or reformist, were cut out of the political process entirely. So Second Thought's first argument as to why the National Socialists weren't real socialists is because they targeted and imprisoned and executed communists and socialists in Germany. This is true. Yet he ignores the fact that Hitler didn't just target communists and socialists, but he even targeted capitalists. Shortly after abolishing the Social Democratic Party and the Communist Parties of Germany, he then went after the Center Party of Germany and any other remaining political parties. The Center Party was a Catholic laissez-faire capitalist party. On top of that, the party's former leader and former chancellor, Franz von Papen, who was a capitalist, was actually arrested during Hitler's rise to power. And yet, Second Thought does not bring this up. Now, by his logic, since Hitler arrested the socialists and communists, that means he can't be a socialist. And yet, he doesn't apply the same standard for Hitler being a capitalist. Hitler arrested capitalists, therefore, he's not a capitalist. But he doesn't bring that up. On top of that, there's the absolute absurdity of ignoring what has been going on in the USSR at the same time. Both Lenin and Stalin purged socialists who disagreed with their methods. So does that mean Lenin and Stalin aren't socialists? I don't know what his stances are on Stalin, but in the video he makes reference to Lenin as a socialist leader. So clearly he believes that Lenin is a real socialist. And yet Lenin did in fact kill and purge and arrest the Mensheviks for disagreeing with his methods. So why the double standard? All this was part of Hitler and the Nazis' plan against so-called Judeo-Bolshevism the name of the conspiracy theory which claimed that socialism was nothing more than a Jewish plot to undermine so-called ethnic German society. Already there are two more problems with this video. He points out that Hitler believed that Marxism, and he uses the word socialism, but really what Hitler opposed was Marxism, uh, was a Jewish plot to take over Germany and the world. And this is true, but he ignores that Hitler said the same thing about capitalism because again, it does not fit his narrative. In a 1921 speech, Hitler had this to say about capitalism, quote, 
And if we ask who was responsible for our misfortune, then we must inquire who profited from our collapse. And the answer to that question is that banks and stock exchanges are more flourishing than ever before. We were told that capitalism would be destroyed. And when we ventured to remind one or other of these famous statesmen and said, don't forget that Jews have capital too, then the answer will now be destroyed. The whole people will be free. We are not fighting Jewish or Christian capitalism. We are fighting every capitalism. We are making the people completely free. Christian capitalism is already as good as destroyed. The International Jewish Stock Exchange, capital gains in proportion as the others lose ground. It is only the International Stock Exchange and the loan capital, the so-called suprastate capital, which has profited from the collapse of our economic life. To summarize all of that, Hitler essentially believed that any notion of Christian capitalism was gone, and that the remaining capitalism was Jewish capitalism driven by the stock exchange. And yet, second thought does not bring this up, because again, he wants Hitler to be depicted as a capitalist, even though in this speech, it's very clear Hitler is not a fan of capitalism or the stock exchange. He believes that capitalism is a plot by the Jews to take over the world, just as he believes that Bolshevism is also a plot by the Jews to take over the world. To complete this effort, Hitler also cracked down on organized labor. Union leaders and prominent members were hunted down in much the same way the communist politicians were, and were beaten, killed, and imprisoned en masse by Nazi stormtroopers. All trade unions were first occupied, then banned, except for the German labor front a union created and functionally controlled by the Nazi party. Collective bargaining and strikes were gone, and all that was left of the labor movement was the puppet union the Nazi party had set up, which failed even the most basic function of a labor union by bringing employees and employers under the same roof. The whole purpose of labor unions is to be a force of opposition to capitalist authority. Making the two share an institution effectively kills any leverage that workers have. And this was, of course, the point. So now he brings up the myth that Hitler crushed the trade unions. Or rather, it is a half-truth. Yes, Hitler did abolish all private trade unions. But that was so he could nationalize them under the German labor front, which he mentioned. He, of course, tries to make the claim that it was merely a puppet or shell labor uh, union. And that doesn't meet the requirements of a labor union, such as collective bargaining or the ability to strike. But consider this. If the National Socialists represent the workers and essentially become the state, what is the purpose of a labor union? Is a labor union not to oppose the bourgeois? Under socialism, there is no more bourgeois class, so labor unions are no longer necessary. And again, we can look at the USSR to see that Lenin did the exact same thing. When he took over Russia, he immediately abolished the labor unions and created the nationalized syndicate. Both the German Labor Front and the USSR's national syndicates, called workers' councils, were directly controlled by the National Socialists and the Communist parties from above. He points out that it was not democratic and therefore it doesn't make it socialist, I guess, but he's missing the point. The National Socialist Party, in their mind, are already the representatives of the people. After all, they were voted into office. The likewise, in the USSR, they believed they were the representatives of the People's Revolution. As such, any sort of strikes or mass opposition to the state is a rebellion against the workers. So this is why there were no right to strike or collective bargaining, because the workers have already won. They are in power. They are the state. And so any opposition to the state is opposition against the workers. He also states that the German labor front tipped the favor towards the capitalists, and yet first-hand sources show that this is completely untrue. The German labor front, and by extension the National Socialist Party, had expansive control over the private sector. Factory managers could not hire or fire whoever they pleased, and they had to watch their mouth and not criticize the government in any way without risk of being jailed and losing everything. As one example, it was an industrialist who told a story of how he was forced to build a new state-of-the-art gymnasium in his factory, even though neither he nor any of his workers wanted it. 
but the management of the German labor front forced him to build it because they believed that it would be good for the workers to be able to exercise more, despite them already working long hours and being generally tired. Even then, why would Hitler go through the trouble of creating a 32 million man union? That was nearly half the population of Germany. What other purpose would there but to control the industries? On top of that, he ignores the fact that there were still overreaching regulations on virtually every sector, including having price commissars. And yes, National Socialists did have price commissars, just like the USSR. In just a few short months, the Nazis had destroyed labor militancy altogether. But that's not all. You might remember that the Nazis were famous for their book burnings. Unsurprisingly, these same anti-socialist politics were obvious there, too. Many of the authors whose books were burned were central figures in socialist politics, like Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, Vladimir Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg, Leon Trotsky, and many others. No, the National Socialists were against Marxism. Everyone who you mentioned were Marxists. They were not just socialists. They opposed international Marxism, so they destroyed any documents or writings by them. But that does not mean they opposed socialism, because they were socialists. On top of that, as I mentioned before, Stalin did the same thing, destroying all of Leon Trotsky's work from getting out to the public. Because again, he needed to maintain control over the state. But all these events have been brushed under the rug or presented by conservatives as nothing more than socialist infighting, based on... evidence? Which it clearly wasn't. So, Second Thought makes the claim that, there, that there's no evidence that this was an example of socialist infighting. But this is circular logic. He's already coming from the basis that the National Socialists are capitalists. Therefore, there's no evidence of socialist infighting. And because there's no evidence of socialist infighting, that proves that the National Socialists were actually capitalists. The Nazis were both a tool of German capitalists and promoters of the capitalist economy. It's not simply that they crushed labor power and leftist politicians, they actively furthered the interest of capitalists at a time where capitalism was in a bit of a troubled spot, to put it mildly. The first thing we can look at to make these arguments is the institutional support from capitalists that the Nazis received. In short, quite a lot. German industrialists helped promote Hitler's rise to power in every way they could. Capitalists from some of Germany's largest economic sectors invested millions of Reichsmarks, upwards of $30 million today, to prevent the Nazi party from succumbing to its financial difficulties and to help the party win elections. First of all, he states that the Weimar Republic were bourgeois administrations, which is laughable because the Weimar Constitution was written by Friedrich Ebert, who was a socialist. So the Weimar Republic was in many ways innately socialist. But second of all, his main point is, is that, well, big businesses supported Hitler's rise. And that's extremely mixed, to say the least. After all, I can also say that many labor unions supported Hitler's rise to power. So again, that proves that Hitler was not a capitalist or was a socialist. But even then, let's really look into the major industrialists who supported him, the Krupp family and IG Faubin. These two industrialist families were not capitalists. Instead, they controlled public corporations. Public corporations are not a part of the private sector, despite what many people think and what second thought somewhat implies. It's not owned by one individual or one family, but it's owned by a multitude of individuals. So here he's attacking a straw man. This could also be easily interpreted as just a case of the enemy of my enemy as my friend. They both opposed international Marxism. That doesn't mean that the Nazis were capitalists. It just meant that they opposed the same group that the corporations opposed. And even then, going back to Russia again, many nobles actually aided Lenin in his rise to power. So again, is Lenin just not a socialist just because some people who are against socialism supported him? But we can do even better by looking at what the German economy was like during Nazi rule, and how it differed from the economy of other capitalist nations and socialism. Please. Come on, second thought, just don't. Nazis were big on privatization. I'm gonna give you one chance to back away from your argument. You're really gonna pull that card? 
The process of taking publicly owned companies and services and handing them over to capitalists. To quote a paper on the topic, it is a fact that the government of the Nazi party sold off public ownership in several state-owned firms in the mid-1930s. These firms belong to a wide range of sectors. Steel, mining, banking, local public utilities, shipyards, ship lines, railways, etc. In addition, the delivery of some public services that were produced by the government prior to the 1930s, especially social and labor-related services, was transferred to the private sector. In doing so, they went against the mainstream trends in the Western capitalist countries, none of which systematically reprivatized firms during the 1930s. Okay, you asked for it. Of course, like any good socialist, Second Thought plays the they privatize their nation's economy card and cites the somewhat well-known paper by Spanish politician and economist Germa Bell. Bell, as his title implies, argues that the National Socialist Party of Germany during the 1930s expanded the private sector and privatized various industries that were previously nationalized under previous administrations, which is kind of ironic considering Second Thought literally just said that the Weimar Republic was a bourgeois republic, but we'll just overlook that. Here's the thing, even the article that Second Thought cites, even though it does say, yes, the Nazis privatized industries, that actually works against them. This isn't the gotcha card that socialists believe it is. And instead, it is more like a trap card. The problems with citing Bell's paper pop up with the very first paragraph of the abstract. Quote, Privatization in Nazi Germany was also unique in transferring to private hands the delivery of public services previously provided by the government. The firms and services transferred to private ownership belonged to diverse sectors. Privatization was part of an international policy with multiple objectives and was not ideologically driven. As in many recent privatizations, particularly within the EU, strong financial restrictions were a central motivation. In addition, privatization was used as a political tool to enhance support for the government and for the Nazi party. So already off the bat, Bell makes it clear that he is not arguing that the National Socialists enacted these privatization policies because of their ideology, but it was purely out of pragmatism. But even then, Bell gets it wrong. And when you actually look at the privatization, it's not actually privatization, and it's really just the National Socialist Party, aka the state, transferring its power to another apparatus. Here's what Bell had to say in the second part of his thesis. Quote, Soon after the Nazi party came to power, United Steel was reorganized so that the government majority stake of 52% was converted into a stake of less than 25%, no longer sufficient in German law to give the government any privilege in the company control. Fritz Thyssen, who held the leading position in the trust, had been one of only two big industrialists to give support to the Nazi party before it won political dominance. So right there, you see that the National Socialist Party is really just transferring their power from the government directly to members of their party who, while not technically in the government and thus are technically considered private citizens, are in reality an extension of the state. This was Adolf Hitler's economic plan called Gleichschalten or synchronization. The idea was that every aspect of German life would work together, albeit independently. The reason is because the Nazis did not want another economic collapse like had happened in the USSR due to the inefficiencies of government-run programs. The National Socialists would technically privatize these industries to industrialists and various other leaders, but they would still maintain firm control over all of these industries and over all of these industrialists. This is not privatization. And yet, Second Thought wants to make it that way because, again, that's his narrative. But the Nazis retained the ability to guide economic production when it suited their needs. 
usually to promote imperialist or wartime goals. This is not unusual. Even the US took the reins on production during the war. But this will often get brought up as an argument that the Nazis were somehow socialists. Except these supposed wartime efforts were enacted during peace. And yes, the United States also nationalized various industries during war. The majority of countries will do that. But the National Socialists did it during peacetime. And he acts as if there was very little regulation or oversight. But that was not the case. Like I said, there have been various instances where the National Socialist Party, whether it be through the National Labor Front or just through their connections with private citizens, had extensive control over the economy and the private sector to the point where it was no longer private. In fact, during this period, many industrialists even looked towards Marxism to better understand how to navigate the National Socialist system. So he claims they were actually capitalists and yet the contemporary industrialists look towards Marxism to better understand the national socialist system. What results is an economy that could only be called socialism if your definition of socialism never addressed the question of private property. In other words, the most basic concern of socialist politics. Except Hitler did in fact abolish private property. That's right, many people don't realize this and I often see online people argue that Hitler couldn't possibly be a socialist because he didn't abolish private property. Never mind the fact that the USSR and nearly every other socialist country has never actually been able to successfully abolish private property in its entirety. But I would argue that National Socialists were the closest to doing it. When Article 48 was enacted, Hitler took the liberty to suspend various other articles of the Constitution. In his decree, he, he is quoted as saying, Article 1. Sections 114, 115, 117, 118, 123, 124, and 153 of the Constitution of the German Reich are suspended until further notice. Therefore, restrictions on personal liberty, on the right to free expression of opinion, including freedom of the press, on the right of assembly and right of association, and violations of the privacy of postal, telegraphic, and telephonic communications, warrants for house searches, orders for confiscations, as well as restrictions on property, are also permissible beyond the legal limits otherwise prescribed. Keep in mind, both Articles 115 and 153 essentially guarantee property rights to German citizens. So Hitler suspended property rights, or at least the legal protections, and could have confiscated property whenever he wanted, which he did. The reason he didn't do it all at once immediately is because he feared a potential economic collapse and thus upheaval in the public. But it is clear that Hitler wanted to eventually abolish property rights and that the country would slowly evolve into a more true socialist state, similar to what Lenin's plan was in the USSR. Of course, while this whole video has been making a strong case for the Nazis were not socialist argument, it's important to note a few slightly more valid counterarguments and why they don't ultimately change this conclusion. For starters, like all political parties, the Nazis had internal divisions, and it's true that some of the party's notable early members had anti-capitalist motivations, and even disagreed with the general pro-capitalist direction of the party and Hitler himself. However, the reason this fact is not ultimately damning to our greater argument is that these anti-capitalist Nazis were still fiercely and primordially nationalistic and racist, and therefore in contradiction with the internationalist and egalitarian ideals baked into socialist politics. Wait, did he seriously just say that socialists can't be racist? While it is true that they, at least in theory, support egalitarianism, that doesn't mean that they weren't racists. Marx, believe it or not, actually hated the Jews, and Stalin was also a racist. There's also plenty of examples of left-wing communists or socialists or even figures on the left. People like Mao Zedong, Ho Chi Minh, Fidel Castro, Nelson Mandela, and Mahatma Gandhi, the last two obviously not being dictators, but still prominent left socialist figures. You don't have to be on the political right to be a nationalist. Left-wing nationalism is in fact a thing. And by the way, this is why it was called National Socialism. It differed from Marxist Socialism, which placed value on a person's political class and put the value on an individual's race. 
Hitler wanted the Aryan race to be equal. He just did not view the other races as being equal, hence why it has the national in front of it. Secondly, this video started with a long and frankly boring definition of socialism for a reason. I did this on purpose because although Hitler had the word socialism in the name of his party, he also made every effort to distance this word from its original definition. Well, we can actually find out what Hitler's definition of socialism was. This was from an unpublished book of Hitler's writings. Quote, I am a German nationalist. This means that I proclaim my nationality. My whole thought and action belongs to it. I am a socialist. I see no class and no social estate before me, but the community of the folk, made up of people who are linked by blood, united by a language, and subject to the same general fate. I love this folk, and hate only its majority of the moment, because I view the latter to be just as little representative of the greatness of my folk as it is of its happiness. So Hitler outright says that he does not believe in social class, which socialists also claim. And Hitler at various other parts, again, denounces capitalism and supports nationalization. He even outright says at one point that he wants to socialize human beings. So how is his definition of socialism different from the conventional usage, the one that Second Thought defined earlier on in the video as the collective ownership of the common. How is Hitler's definition of socialism different? Anyway, that's going to do it for this video. Like I said, it was a little frustrating because these arguments aren't even original, and they're the same arguments that you will hear in all academic sources and in universities, and it's really frustrating for people who actually study the subject and realize that the National Socialists were, in fact, socialists and were living up to their names, arguably more so than any socialist country in the existence of mankind. But what do you guys think? Do you guys agree with my position, or do you think Second Thought provided better uh, evidence? Please leave a like, comment, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video.